All right, good morning. Welcome to the, the seminar. We have a, a great opportunity to learn from the experts this morning. Uh, we have Ed Lorenz of GeoOptimize and Tom Wire of GeoFlow Corporation. They will be given a joint presentation, providing a deeper look into commercial design. The presentation will specifically address commercial geothermal loop field configurations and pumping. Ed Lorenz is the founder of GeoOptimize, which specializes in design workshops, determining project feasibility, and the design of ground loops and mechanical systems. He has been in the ground source heat pump industry since the early 1980s. Tom Wire is president of GeoFlow Corporation, a manufacturer of pumping systems and components for hydronic-based HVAC systems, including geothermal. He has been with the company since 2005. I've certainly learned a lot from these two guys over the years, and I'm sure you will too. Um, please submit your questions through the chat feature. I will read them at the end of the presentation and the speakers will have a chance to, to respond. Now over to the stars of the show. Uh, first up, uh, Ed Lorenz. Thanks again. Hi, everybody. Um, I'm going to be talking, uh, if you um, got the last presentation back at the end of August, this is sort of a continuation of it. And uh, as uh, Jeff mentioned, looking at both the configuration of the ground heat chamber, the iterative nature of the design of those systems, not a whole lot different than the iterative nature of the design of the design of the mechanical system and the, uh, the ground heat exchanger, how much, uh, how much borehole you need or how much pipe you need in the ground. Um, so basically what uh, we'll be going through the configuration uh, and what the impact is of different configurations on the size, size and the performance of a ground heat exchanger. And uh, Tom will talk a bit more about the uh, about the pump uh, the impact on pumping uh, on the pumping pump selection and uh, based on what the pressure drops and uh, or the fluid um, characteristics are that are selected. So, just a quick uh, look at the importance of understanding the difference between designing a uh, ground source system compared to a conventional system. Uh, peak loads uh, on a conventional system, basically somebody else is designing the energy source, the gas company, gas utility, the electric utility, or the oil delivery serv service. And uh, for getting rid of the heat, a lot of times the water utility is involved and uh, getting rid of the heat is metered. Uh, you're paying for it and you have as much energy as you want to pay for. And you can design the energy source uh, simply uh, for, the, for, for cooling the building, selecting a cooling tower out of a catalog or out of a website or talking to a manufacturer is pretty straightforward. Somebody else is designing the equipment that gets rid of the heat that you're trying to get rid of from the building. Same thing with the heat source, the, uh, the fuel that you're using. If it's a, if it's a gas line, the gas companies and uh, the, there's charts and tables available. All you need to know is what the peak heating load is. And you can select the uh, pipe size, the gas pipe size, based on how many BTUs you need to deliver on the coldest day of the winter. Uh, but with a ground source system, you really have to design the, the energy source as well as the, the equivalent of the cooling tower. You're designing the, the heat source, the condenser for it. And there's a lot of different options. And that's one of the beauties of this industry and uh, is that there are so many options and it really depends on the land area that you've got available depends on the equipment that you've got available to install it, uh, the geology that you're working with, uh, or and uh, all of those things have, a, have an impact on how you can design the ground heat exchanger to really optimize the performance of the whole system. Rules of thumb, uh, same with uh, ground heat exchanger design, same with uh, building mechanical system design, they don't apply. And, and that's simply because you are designing the energy source for the building. Um, you need to basically design a system. If, if you're gonna get a system installed in a place, it's gotta be able to be built cost-effectively by the contractors that are available to build it. You have to be able to get the dirt and debris out of it and the air out of the system. Um, you've gotta minimize pumping energy, the parasitic loads that are, that are necessary but you wanna try and minimize the parasitic loads as much as possible. And you also wanna make sure that the heat transfer capability is maximized. You're putting a lot of pipe in, in the ground and it's expensive to get it in there. 
and what you're you want to make sure that you're getting all the heat transfer that you need from that ground loop. So basically uh, suggesting that the design details are pretty critical for the cost of the system and the efficient operation of the system over time. As we looked at uh, in the previous uh, session that in August, basically looking at the difference, how much the amount of pipe that you need to put in the ground varies pretty significantly. And you, you have the opportunity to work with the architects, with the engineers, with the building owners to make changes to the building. If the building owner comes to you with a proposed building design or an architect, what happens if you put an economizer in the system in the, to supply fresh air uh, using uh, or cooling uh, using outside air or have a night setback on the system? Uh, and, that, and that's under your control or the mechanical system designer's control or in some cases the building owner's control. Uh, look at occupant, occupancy and CO2 sensors to minimize the uh, impact of outdoor, fresh outdoor air. Uh, so the final design we ended up, compared to rules of thumb, uh, 24,000 square foot building, 400 square feet per ton, 200 feet of drilling per ton, 12,000 feet of borehole. That ultimately was reduced down to about 7,000 feet of borehole. So one of the real things to look at on designing how much pipe needs to go on the ground is really how you interpret the building heating and cooling loads. With the checksums loads, the design heating loads, uh, this particular project ended up with about 54 tons of cooling and 56 tons of heating requirement. That's the, basically that is kind of the worst case scenario on the hottest day or the coldest day of the year. Uh, potentially you could reach, reach that kind of a heating load and that kind of a cooling load. But what the ground heat exchanger sees almost most of the time, 99.9% .9 of the time, is often a lot lower than what the design equipment load is. In this case, the block loads of the building ended up being about 46 tons versus about, about 54 tons of equipment and 41 tons of heating capacity rather than 56. So this is about 25% lower than the design heating, the, the design heating load and about 15% lower than the design cooling load. That's you know, partly because of the diversity of how the building is, different parts of the building are being used. And um, you know, like the, the, the peak loads on a, on a meeting room and one on the east side of the building are not gonna coincide with the peak cooling loads on, uh, on the west side of the building uh, on the same day at the same time. They simply don't occur at the same time. So what we're looking for is what, if, if we're looking at the peak zone loads of each building, this is what the equipment is designed for. Um, if we add up these peaks, that totals up to 681,000 BTUs per hour. But if we look at those peak loads and some of the peak loads, that's right here, 681,000 BTUs per hour. And we look at the peak block loads, that occurs at three in the afternoon. And those loads, this is the same peak load, but this peak load or the load on this, uh, on, in this area, at this, uh, in this zone is a lot lower than the, the peak load of that particular zone. And same with all of the others. So this is significantly lower than the, uh, than the, than the uh, some of the peak loads. So th there's a fairly significant difference. What that means on the design of the ground heat exchanger is you look one of, this is what the ground heat exchanger is gonna see the block loads compared to the sum of the peak loads. That translates into quite a difference. If you're looking at three gallons per minute per ton, 171 gallons per minute rather uh, uh, versus 138 gallons per minute. So that means that could have an impact on the size of pipe that you select. The, uh, and that's gonna have an impact on the fluid volume all of those things are impacted by that. And it's also gonna make a difference on how you, when you're calculating how that ground heat exchanger is gonna perform over time, what the energy balance is and uh, what kind of spacing you should have it, have between the boreholes. And then you also have to look at what regional, the contractors that are gonna be potentially bidding on this project, what are they capable of drilling? And uh, when um, in the, uh, Last presentation, we, when we talked to the drillers, drilling contractors in that area, they, their preferred depth in that area is somewhere in, in the range of 250 to 300 feet of borehole 
uh, on on a in that it, once you get deeper than that, it gets a lot more expensive, and uh, it, it wasn't worthwhile drilling shallower boreholes on that area. So that was their recommended range. range. So basically, what we're looking at, uh, you've got to design the detailed design of the Gandhi heat exchanger. Once we've gone through all the feasibility, and that's what we talked about on the previous uh, presentation, looking at confirming the conductivity of the soil that you, based on the assumptions that you've made. Now we can design the ground heat exchanger, and that's based on getting the 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 <coughs> logical information, and uh, and working with that. So one of the, like I mentioned earlier, there's three things you really need to look at: maximizing heat transfer, making sure the Reynolds numbers are high enough that you're going to get good a good heat transfer, especially at the uh, in the heating mode when you're approaching uh, lower than 40, 35, 30 degrees Fahrenheit, depending on where you're. Um, of where you're located. Uh, so you want to make sure that in the worst case scenario, based on the block loads of the building, that you can maximize heat transfer. Reynolds numbers have to be high enough. You also want to minimize the parasitic loads of, of pump power. Uh, you want, don't want to oversize the pump. It's not really contributing, especially if you've got a building that is maybe slightly or fairly cooling dominant. Uh, you don't want to add ex extra energy to it. Just as an example, a 10 horsepower pump draws roughly seven and a half kilowatts. About 80% 80 per, 80 of that seven and a half kilowatts ends up being injected into the ground heat exchanger through friction losses through the pipe. And, uh, and that's gonna heat up the ground heat exchanger more. I've seen probably about three or four projects over the last four or five years that have been overheated simply because of the way the pump is, has the selection of the pump or the way the pump has been operated. Uh, so it, it can have a big impact on that, you want to minimize this as much as you can, really reducing the pressure drop. Then you also have to be able to avoid having to order or get somebody in with a huge flush cart to get the air and the dirt out of the system, because that's going to make it more expensive to build, and uh, it's going to be it's going to potentially delay construction and things like that as well. So basically, and what uh, Dr. Kavanaugh, Steve Kavanaugh says in his, in his manual, which uh, many of you probably have, is the pump power that you're using is a, is a big deal, about 45 watts per ton of block load. That's probably about where you want to be. And what that means is about, let, you should have a system designed, if you've got 100 tons, your pump power shouldn't be much more than about five horsepower. Um, if you're starting to get to 10, five, 10, 15 horsepower, uh, you're going to get a failing grade from Dr. Kavanaugh. And that means the, uh, the, the efficient head, you want to try and keep the overall head of the system down below 45 to 50 feet of head. Uh, if you're getting up to 90 or 100, 100 and over 100 feet of head on the system, your system is, over, is uh, you should look at the configuration of John Heath to try and avoid that kind of situation. So heat transfer is really affected by to a large degree by what the velocity is of the fluid through the uh, through the through the pipe. Uh, if you've got laminar flow, what happens? If you think about floating uh, going down a down a river in the middle of summer when the flow is not very high, uh, it's not hard to uh, to paddle a canoe upstream because the the water is is simply not it's stuck to the stuck to the banks or stuck to the it, pipe wall. If you've got turbulent flow, if you've got a river uh, going, coming out of the Rockies, running downhill a lot, you're going to get turbulent flow in that. And that's going to wash away all of this, uh, the water that's stuck to the, to the pipe wall. You're going to get a lot better heat transfer instead of having to transfer heat from the soil through the pipe, through the water that's just sitting there doing nothing. So you're finally getting to the point where the water is moving you're gonna, gonna reduce the heat transfer pretty significantly. And that's gonna be affected by the type of fluid that, you, that you're selecting, the pipe sizes that you're using throughout the whole system. You also have to consider both the, the, the borehole depth that it's cost effective to drill in that area. And that's really gonna depend on the thermal properties of the soil. Uh, you're looking at the land area that you've got available and what's the most cost effective drilling depth. We'll take the building that we looked at in the previous presentation, about a 24,000 square foot building. We ended up with somewhere around uh, 7,200 feet of drilling of thereabouts. 
and looking at just the fluid flow through the system. We're basing this, um, many of these uh, calculations based on about, about 20% of propylene glycol. We're looking at three things, the Reynolds numbers, looking at the total pump power that's needed and the pressure drop, and how much flow you're gonna need to get the air and uh, dirty debris out of the system and how much pump power you're gonna need for that. The first system we looked at, uh, 22 boreholes to a depth of 295 feet within the cost-effective drilling range, one inch U-tubes, and that we looked at that simply because that's what many of the drillers were used to using in that area. And then a lot of the drillers tended to stick with two inch pipe supply and return runouts when possible, simply because that's what they're used to dealing with. So in this case, we've got a pressure drop, 4.38 feet, uh, or 4.3, 4.4 horsepower pump. And looking at, this was based on the, of the 172 gallons per minute that we looked at if you were using the design loads of the equipment. This one was based on the equipment block loads. So that makes a pretty big difference on how big a horse, how big a pump you're going to be selecting. So you need higher gallons, gallons per minute and uh, then with the block loads. You should be probably aiming for the block loads of the building, maybe give yourself a little bit of safety factor and allow for a variable speed pump of some sort. So look at the next option. We've changed the, this to one and a quarter inch pipe instead of one inch pipe. So that decreases the pressure drop a bit. We're down to 3.3 horsepower if you were going with 171 gallons per minute. If you're going with the block loads, then the pressure drop drops down to 44 feet of head. We're down to under two horsepower. So looking at changing, looking at where the pressure drop is, if we change the supply and return runouts to three inch pipe instead of two inch pipe, uh, we've reduced the pump power here simply by making that one change down to about one horsepower. And if we're going with the, uh, with the more appropriate flow rates that you uh, need with the block loads, about uh, under, under 0.6 horsepower. So that's a pretty big difference on this. It does increase the, uh, the purging flow rate, we're at 110 gallons, gallons per minute, and we were at, uh, 100, um, at uh, 73 gallons per minute before that because of the pipe size, the one inch pipe versus the inch, uh, inch and a quarter pipe. And then the next thing we looked at was what happens if we've got room for an additional borehole, a little bit shallower boreholes. 23 boreholes. And uh, one of the things that you can do with uh, some of the software that's out there, you, you can actually calculate, can you do this kind of a thing where you've got 12 boreholes on one and 11 boreholes on the other? And you get a bigger range in the, um, in the, uh, in the Reynolds numbers. And again, here we're starting to look at, we determined that we're gonna be running at about 138 gallons per minute with the block loads of the building. And uh, looking at about, under 0.6 horsepower and looking at uh, Reynolds numbers that are well above the, the range that we need, uh, about 2,300, 2,500 or thereabouts. And the uh, purging rate hasn't changed a whole bunch. So we're still looking at uh, about 110 gallons per minute to flush the air from the system. And the Reynolds numbers in all the boreholes, even though some of them are, 11, or one of the borehole modules is uh, 11 boreholes and the other one is 12. Uh, it's going to work. You're going to get a bigger, a bit difference in the flow rate. Uh, you're going to get a bit more flow rate through the system that has has the the 12 uh, boreholes connected to it. Okay, then looking at what happens if you select the, based on the on the type of antifreeze that you're selecting. So we looked at three different different things here. Looking at 28% propylene glycol, 23.3%, and 17%. We bumped up the number of boreholes to 12 just to balance the, load, the flow rate a little bit more equally. Three inch pipe and inch and a quarter supply and return rounds. Notice right here that the, the Reynolds numbers are less than 2000 here. And that's simply because of the fluid that has been selected and installed on the system. 28% propylene glycol, you're looking at uh, Reynolds numbers, you're gonna run into problems with that the next winter when the temperature drops um, 
and the Reynolds numbers are lower than they are good, than are conducive for good heat transfer between the pipe and the dirt. So reduce that antifreeze ball, uh, percentage down to about 23.3%. You're starting to get the range where the, I'm pretty comfortable with that at the lowest temperature that we expect the system to run at. If you uh, drop that down to just under 20%, the Reynolds numbers are going to be well with it, uh, give, give you a lot of comfort that a uh, bit of a safety pack to make sure that even under peak conditions, if the temperature drops a little bit lower, the viscosity of the fluid increases, um, you're, you're still going to be okay. Here, what can happen on a situation like this where you're fairly close, if, it, if you've got a long, prolonged cold snap and uh, the temperature drops down to, let's say, 30 degrees, you designed the system for 30, 32 degrees, if it drops down to 30 or 29, what can I've, I've seen happen on a couple of projects is that the Reynolds numbers start doing a nosedive, and then you're getting the you're not getting enough heat transfer from the ground to the fluid that's actually moving the fluid to the heat pumps. You may be getting close to the right flow rate, but you're not getting the heat transfer that you need because a lot of fluid is stuck to the pipe wall, reducing the heat transfer, and you, the temperature is going to drop, and you're going to get a low pressure lockout on the heat pumps. So looking at uh, a different configuration of, of 12 boreholes, here we've got them fairly concentrated right fairly close to the building uh, or to the mechanical room. Sometimes you can't do that in some situations and you've got a different configuration of boreholes. Pressure drop, in this case, uh, we've got three inch pipe, inch and a quarter bore, um, pipe on there. And looking at, in this case, we've looked at a direct return header simply to try and reduce pressure drop. And some of the software will allow you to calculate, is that gonna work or not? You're gonna get a much bigger range in the Reynolds numbers. And potentially what can happen, depending on the selection of the propylene glycol antifreeze um, percentage that you've selected, even, and you're looking at the lower flow rates with the block loads of the building, if the temperature of that drops a little bit, you could potentially get to the point where some of those boreholes aren't gonna give you, give you the heat transfer and you're gonna start running into problems. And looking at the what what you can do in a situation like that, even if you do install balancing valves on here, we've got the balancing valves on here. Because you've got these, the flow rate through each of the boreholes isn't going to be affected by the balancing valves. The balancing valves only affect the flow rate through the supply and return runouts. It's not going to affect the the flow rate through each of the individual boreholes. You're still going to get a fairly big range. In the uh, in the Reynolds numbers, so you're still going to run potentially into that problem. You have increased the pressure drop a little bit from 9.6 to 10.1 feet simply by adding the the uh, the balancing valves. Um, but you get a, you know, the problem. You, you can run into problems with that simply because of the range in the Reynolds numbers in there, and the flow rate through each uh, through each module. Then you can start looking at, uh, you may run into a contractor that simply doesn't want to use the three inch supply and return runouts. Uh, can you do this system with, uh, by instead of having two supply and return runouts with uh, 12 boreholes on each, or look at uh, eight boreholes on each of three runouts, on two inch runouts. That does increase the pressure drop on, on the pump power. You get the Reynolds numbers on here that are, uh, I, I, you balance the flow a little bit. But because this supply return line is quite a bit longer than this one, you are going to get a bit of a range. And in this kind of a situation, you are going to get uh, even even the flow through each of these supply and return runouts. You're going to get them getting a bit closer together, more so than you saw in the previous uh, example. Also, notice that uh, that the uh, purging flow rate has been reduced down to about 86 gallons per minute. Simpler for the contractor to get the air out of the system and uh, and clean the system up. Uh, going to three inch supply and return runouts instead of the two inch. Um, evens out the flow a little bit, even without the balancing valves, uh, and reduces the pump power. We're down to under 0.4 horse horsepower. So really reduce the pump size pretty significantly. Here we're looking at uh, with the Two inch runouts, we're looking at about 22 feet ahead. Three inch runouts, we're looking at about nine or 10 feet ahead. 
So that's a pretty significant difference and has an impact on the size of pump that you're going to select for an operation. Um, then we can go to four supplied return runners. Can you do four inch comfortably with a reasonable pressure drop using two inch supply and return runners? So six times four. So pressure drop, we're looking at 14, 15 feet ahead. That's pretty decent. Reynolds numbers are all fairly decent. We're looking at balancing valves on there that will even out the flow through each of the uh, of the non heat exchanger modules, um, simply because you've got less. Uh, you're getting fairly equal flow through each of the supply return nodes. You've got a reverse return. Those Reynolds numbers are going to be pretty equal throughout the, all of the boreholes. The other benefit you do have if you've got four supply and return runouts is you've got better system redundancy. If you, somebody pokes a hole in one of the supply and return runouts uh, by putting in a street lamp or something like that, then um, you've still got three quarters of the system there. So there's a benefit that way. Um, you're looking at smaller pipe sizes. You're looking at under 0.6 horsepower, 0.7 horsepower with balancing valves. And then take it to one level further, six boreholes on each of, uh, or six ground heat exchanger modules two inch supply and return runouts. We're back down to about nine, 10, 12 feet ahead. Uh, Reynolds numbers are pretty decent. Flow rate that you need to flush each one of the modules is not about 40 gallons per minute. So it's gonna be fairly easy for a contract for a, a, a bigger range of contractors that can bid on it and clean, make sure it's cleaned out effectively. And then looking at, um, um, and I have run into this kind of situation where a driller wants to bid on it, but they don't have the equipment that can drill to the depth that you would like. So instead of putting in uh, in 24 boreholes, we're looking at 48 boreholes, connecting two of the boreholes in series on each ground heat exchanger module. So you two boreholes connected in series, another two, another two, another two. So you've got basically four circuits in there. It basically is very similar to this, except you've got twice as many boreholes and they're uh, half the depth. Again, you're going to get fairly similar performance on it. Because the supply and return runouts are a lot longer on some of these, you're going to get a bigger range in the Reynolds numbers and the flow rate through each unit, through each uh, module. But that can be dealt with with balancing valves. So we're looking at, uh, in this case, 0.6 horsepower, which is not bad. And then looking at the uh, six uh, rod heat exchanger modules with, uh, with eight boreholes on each, if they aren't connected up in series, these two boreholes, you've got twice as many boreholes. Looking at one inch tube on there, what you are going to run into then is a Reynolds number that are going to be too low to operate effectively. And uh, you're, you're not, even with balancing valves, you're not going to solve the problem. You're going to have to increase the flow rate to get the Reynolds numbers high enough during peak heating loads. If you change that to three quarter inch pipe, um, again, you might have to adjust the total borehole depth a little bit to allow for less heat transfer, probably 10, five, 10% or so. Uh, Reynolds numbers start getting a little bit better. They're better when you use the balancing valves, more equally, uh, more equal flow through each of the ground heat exchanger modules. But the uh, Reynolds numbers here, if you don't look at the balance of valves and they're not set up properly by the, by the contractor, uh, you can potentially run the problem in some of the boreholes. And reduces the flow rate that you need to flush the air resistant down to about 33 gallons per minute. You're flushing each one of these individually. Uh, but there's a lot of different ways to do that. So, and there is software out there available to, uh, to, that can give you a detailed look at what the flow rate is through each circuit what the pressure drop is to each circuit, what the pipe velocity is during the purging flow rates, and make sure that you're above the two feet per second, uh, that the pressure drop is reasonably equal to it, all of the system, and that the Reynolds numbers are high enough. So what I'm basically saying is there's a lot of different ways to, that you can design the ground heat exchanger. And it's gonna have an impact on the size of pump that you select and uh, what flow rate that you select, is, design the system to operate at. We looked at the design loads and then we looked at the block loads. This is going to give you better performance on the system and still meet the heating and cooling needs of the building. 
So looking at the two inch supply and return runouts with one inch E-tube, uh, pressure drop is pretty high, 85 feet ahead. Four, under, probably a five horsepower pump is what you'd need for this to run it effectively. Even with the, with the because of the high pressure drop to the two inch runouts, one inch pipe, uh, you're looking at still about two and a half horsepower pump or a three horsepower pump you'd probably end up with in there at least. Uh, so you want to look at a couple different ways of potentially reducing the pressure drop, either by looking at the three inch supply and return runouts instead of the two inch, or bumping the pipe size up on the YouTube from one inch to one and a quarter inch. So that gets you down to close to one horsepower. Uh, at the proper flow rates, you're down to about under 0.6 horsepower. So a three quarter horsepower pump would probably do that. Looking at the balancing valves, that's going to affect the uh, make make sure that you get fairly even flow rate through the through the boreholes or through each ground heat exchanger module. And if you've got a lot of boreholes, if you've got a direct uh, a direct uh, header, that's going to make a difference on how that's going to react. Really, be pay attention to this. Make sure that the proper antifreeze selection is installed in the system, and, and that that the, the contractor is actually installing that percentage because it is going to make a difference on how well that ground heat exchanger is going to perform. Uh, you're going to have to either bump up the flow rates or drop the percentage of, of antifreeze to get the Reynolds numbers to where they need to be. You're looking at a direct return header instead of a reverse return header. They can work, but you want to be careful on that because you are going to get a fairly big range in the Reynolds numbers. You want to make sure that this lowest number is within the range of where that system is going to work. And even adding balancing valves, depending on how many boreholes you have connected to it, it's not going to have much of an impact on that. Then you're looking at uh, the number of runouts that are being installed. Can you do it with two inch? With, if you've got three runout pairs, uh, you're increasing the pump power a little bit. Looking at uh, three inch runouts, uh, that drops the pressure drop, uh, the pump horsepower down to under under half a horsepower. Looking at uh, four ground heat exchange modules instead of three with two inch runouts, pump power is getting a bit better. And you're getting still getting decent Reynolds numbers. Uh, six six uh, supply and return Reynolds pairs. Um, again, you're, you're you're changing the pump power that you need, and it's really worth looking at all the different kind of configurations that you're looking at that you could potentially use on there. Direct return header on there. In this case, if you have the balancing valves on there, because you've got fewer boreholes on each ground heat exchanger module, there's less uh, there's less an in, of an impact with the direct return header if you've got the balancing valves. Short boreholes uh, may need twice as many U-tubes connected in series. Uh, that can work as well. So if you can change the design accordingly and you've got the space to do it, there's nothing wrong with doing that. You want to make sure that the thermal conductivity of the shallower boreholes is going to be similar to what you had anticipated. Uh, but you want to, but there's no reason if it is that you're not, it's not going to work. And then you may want to think about reducing the YouTube size if you are going to have more boreholes. You've got 48 boreholes. Uh, these are not connected in series. You've got uh, running in parallel. Reynolds numbers are potentially going to be too low for it, even with balancing valves. Three quarter inch pipe, uh, you can get there with balancing valves in this kind of a situation but you may need a little bit higher flow rate than you were anticipating. Okay, Tom, do you wanna talk about the pumps uh, and how that the changes affect the, the, uh, the size of the pump on the system, the selection of pump that you can use? Yeah, thank you, Ed. Yeah. Um, so as Ed has made a really good case for and pointed out, uh, pretty well. The focusing on the details of the ground heat exchanger design is extremely important and really has a lasting impact on the overall system performance, uh, the overall system efficiency, and the operating cost to run the system long term. Um, optimizing that ground loop heat exchanger uh, to perform well and, and have the lowest pressure drop as possible given the available resources um, in that local area uh, with pipe availability, ability to, the for the contractor to fuse a certain pipe size, for example, 
Optimizing that ground loop uh, heat exchanger design also provides a couple of additional benefits to make your job as a designer and the installation actually much, much easier and more cost effective. So those two things are one, providing a wider selection of pump choices and the ability to pick uh, the most efficient, lowest cost types of pumps, variable speed pumps available on the market today. The second benefit is that it allows for a wider variety or wider design possibility on the inside of the building. So keep in mind that depending on your interior piping design, the pump may also have to overcome the head loss, not only through the ground loop, as, as Ed pointed out, but also through the building and the heat pumps. So I'll talk about some basic layouts for plumbing and uh, pumping options just in a few minutes. So one thing to keep in mind is that ASHRAE 90.1 requires variable speed pumps on large systems. So if we look at, look at what ASHRAE 90.1 says, it says basically that if you have a system that has total pump power exceeding 10 horsepower and also includes control valves designed to modulate or open and close as a functional load, it has to have variable flow. Um, the other thing that this uh, guide tells us is that if you use an individual pump serving a variable flow system, that your any motor exceeding five horse should, should have some controls built in to modulate the flow. So basically it's requiring uh, variable speed uh, pumps on these types of systems. Now, if you take these guidelines and, and follow them very, very strictly, unfortunately, they're fairly easy to get around. And ironically, um, optimizing your ground loop design, as Ed just discussed, can really have a negative impact on this on this requirement because it gives a, a maximum level for horsepower. Um, I, I'll give you a quick example. I just got a call yesterday afternoon from, from a customer on a really large job, so 113 tons split on 11 ground loops. Each of the 11 ground loops served multiple heat pumps and um, each of those 11 ground loops had, the engineer had called out using either a two or three horsepower pump. So on this particular job, there were 24 horsepower of pumps specified, but none of the pumps had callouts for modulating valves or any kind of flow control. So based on that information, the design engineer was expecting the pumps to run 24 seven to serve the building. It's the only way that it would, would actually operate. So that since those heat pumps didn't have, uh, did not have uh, zone valves or modulating valves, it technically doesn't violate the language in, in, in uh, 90.1, but it definitely violates the intention of the rule, which is to limit your pumping power. Um, and it doesn't really serve the industry well. And more importantly, the customer, the building owner, um, it certainly doesn't serve well as they'll have to pay for those higher annual operating costs forever uh, once that system is installed. So not only do you have to focus on, on good ground heat exchanger design, but be sure that your job specifications include um, the system to run as low a cost as possible, despite any kind of rules from ASHRAE or uh, the DOE. So one, one last point is that the DOE is currently uh, conducting an investigation looking at efficiency limits on pumps that may not specifically require uh, may not specifically require ECM pumps, and ECM technology, but the standards will be so high that you will effectively be required to use some kind of an ECM uh, pump technology, variable speed pumps. So as I mentioned before, having low head loss design allows you to pick the highest efficiency pumps available in the market today. Um, and those are the ones that use proto-magnet motors with integrated controls. And after, actually over the last few years, the manufacturers of these systems, Grunfoss, Taco, Velo, Bell & Gossett, Armstrong, pretty much all the manufacturers have permanent magnet variable speed ECM pump technology today. Um, th this technology is spread through the industry and you can get pretty much every design of, of pump um, with permanent magnet motors and ECM pumps. Um, the first choice should be wet rotor uh, inline circulators with ECMs. Um, and these varieties are the smallest, most compact, and also the most energy efficient and lowest cost. Um, but this technology, this permanent magnet technology is also available on larger pumps that either use close coupled or split coupled circulators like shown here. Um, and you can also get them in vertical, vertical multi-stage pumps and also horizontal multi-stage pumps. Now, 
If you're getting into vertical and multi-stage pump specifications, it's probably because you have a very, very high head loss. Uh, that's the way those pumps are designed for higher head systems. So although you can choose a vertical multi-stage pump for large systems, if you do so, it's probably because your ground heat exchanger has not been completely optimized. Um, the other great thing about ECM pumps is that they have built-in controls that allow them to be set up and ran as a standalone system, which means you really don't have to um, have a complex uh, BMX, uh, BMS system uh, installed. And they also don't require uh, complex commissioning uh, controls contractors. So if you do decide, however, to attach these to a, a building management system, they do have inputs and outputs that make that super, super easy. Okay, so the other thing to, to point, point out is that uh, these ECM pumps are available in single and, and also three-phase power. So again, makes, makes your job easy to select these pumps. Typically around two horsepower is the limit for single-phase power. And it's really important to keep in mind because we see a lot of, of very large residential systems that are basically small commercial systems, but they don't have commercial power. They only have single-phase 230-volt pow uh, power available. Um, so it's, it's important to keep that in mind. Another thing that's really important to keep in mind is that wet rotor circulators themselves are not rated in horsepower. So if you're a designer and you're specifying a pump based on horsepower alone, you may accidentally exclude the lowest cost, um, most efficient ECM circulators available, which are the wet rotor variety. Um, these things aren't rated in horsepower because brake horsepower is simply the, the mechanical horsepower used to move the water and used to select the motor that drives the pump. So um, since the manufacturer is already picking the motor and integrates that motor into the pump on the ECM, many of the uh, pump manufacturers don't actually publish horsepower for these style of wet rotor circulators. So the bottom line is the only thing that's really important and really relevant, uh, re relevant is the uh, electrical power used to run the pump. Um, the, the, the ECM circulators, these small wet rotors have really, really uh, come along in, in recent years. And you, you can get them with a really, really high flow rate. So um, th this is just one sample of, of a curve from a, a single manufacturer. You can see that it, it can actually push uh, 240 gallons a minute. So you're talking 80, you know, uh, 80, over 80 tons of equipment at 25 feet ahead. And if you remember Ed's presentation uh, portion earlier, you, you can see that, that that pump would certainly take care of, of that job quite easily. Um, I think his system was 53 tons or something like that uh, and, six, and 1,600 watts. Um, if you need a slightly higher head system, you, you can get these pumps that are available around 40 feet ahead at 120 gallons a minute. Okay, so again, pretty high... Uh, tonnage equipment. So, you know, talking about 40 tons of equipment with uh, under 1300 watts. So if you do the math on that, you can see that you've got an A rating according to Kavanaugh, according to Dr. Kavanaugh. So um, I did a little research this uh, preceding this uh, presentation as well. And I found that one manufacturer and there's, there's multiple manufacturers in the market, obviously, but I found one that provides permanent magnet motors up to 15 horsepower. And I found a pump that can actually do 900 gallons a minute at 40 feet ahead. So again, we've got plenty of, of, of technology out there that if you keep your head loss low, as, as Ed described earlier, then it's really simple to select a pump that will give you an A rating on, on watts and keep the building owner happy. Um, and this is just a quick summary on specifying pumps for our engineers and folks that are doing design work and specifying these things. When you're selecting pumps, be sure to compare the total efficiency not just the hydraulic efficiency of a pump, and there's a difference between the two. Um, most manufacturers have a way of, 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 of providing that information. This is just a quick uh, output of one showing that we want to consider not only the efficiency of the pump, but also the motor and the frequency converter, the VFD or the integrated ECM drive, uh, all as a, as a package. You'll be able to find that with your manufacturer's literature. Um, Next thing is, is when you're really getting into the finer details of the design, best, it's best to compare the watts, not the horsepower. For the reason I mentioned earlier, ECM pumps are often rated in, uh, not rated in horsepower. So it's really tough to make that comparison. When you're doing a initial design, 
the way Ed uh, laid out uh, quite nicely previously with the software that he was using, it's great to compare that horsepower to drive down your expected pump energy. But when you really get into the, into the details and you're specifying those pumps, take a look at the flow and head requirements, not the horsepower. If you're looking at energy usage, make sure the energy usage is in, in watts, uh, not horsepower, because that'll include the drive and the, the motor as well. Um, second point I mentioned earlier is that optimizing the, the ground heat exchanger uh, design allows more choices on building piping. So these are the two impacts that I mentioned of, of driving down the, the pressure drop in the ground heat exchanger. Um, so I want to provide a really quick overview of some common, common designs that we use, uh, that we see in the industry. The actual choice of which system you use is, off, is up to the engineer or system designer, but um, it's really important to be aware of these types of designs so you, you, you know what you can run into. Um, I can't get into the, the details of each of these designs because we're going to run out of time, but I did want to provide a quick overview of each. Uh, the first one is, is basically distributed pumping, and distributed pumping is where a dedicated circulating pump or pump is used for each individual heat pump in the building. Generally an okay way of, of, of designing systems if, if they're smaller, uh, and it does provide a degree of redundancy in the design, which is nice, but it typically leads to higher energy use um, because in general, uh, VS pumps aren't used on distributed pumping. Usually small circulators dedicated to each individual heat pump. Each of those circulators must overcome the uh, head loss of the entire system, interior piping, and also ground loop piping um, when all the systems are running simultaneously. Um, the next variety is central pumping. And with, with central pumping, we are uh, picking a pump that overcomes not only the head loss through the ground loop piping, the ground heat exchanger, but also through the building piping and also the heat pumps themselves. Um, these pumps are controlled on uh, delta P or differential pressure. Uh, and the ECM pumps available in the market today come with, with differential pressure controls built into them. So it makes setting these things up very, very simple. So the way that it works, the pump, uh, is set to a particular differential pressure that allows it to overcome the head loss through the, through the building and through the loop field. Um, and the pump will speed up and slow down its RPMs based on whether each individual heat pump is calling. Each heat pump will include either a, a motorized ball valve and an automatic flow control valve, or in some cases, a modulating valve that controls the flow through each, each individual heat pump. So as the heat pumps uh, drop their calls and the zone valves close or modulate close, the variable speed pump will slow down. So that's a, that's a central, pumping, uh, central pumping system. And just keep in mind when you choose that pump, you have to include the ground loop design and also the building design. And in, in Ed's case, he had a, a ground loop design that was you know, under 15 feet, which is incredibly low for the ground loop. So that puts you in the range of these, these uh, variable speed ECM pumps to limit out you know, around the 40, 45, 50 feet range, depending on the flow rate. Um, the next variety that, that we see often is primary secondary. There's a couple of ways you can do primary secondary. Um, in this particular uh, schematic, we see a primary pump, which is the ground loop pump that would be controlled on differential temperature. So, Again, most of these ECM pumps have the ability to do differential temperature controls. You do have to add an additional uh, sensor in order to um, uh, get a differential temperature. Many of these pumps come with a sensor built into them so they can actually uh, sense temperature with right at the pump itself. It's a single temperature, so you need a second sensor to get differential temperature from in and out. Um, so basically the way these systems work is a, a primary secondary system uses a primary pump that is separated by a device called a hydraulic separator. So the flow that is going on on the ground loop side is not impact or does not influence the pumping that goes on on the building side. So again, the primary pump, delta T, the secondary pump can be a couple of different things. This In this particular schematic, we see a a secondary pump that's a, also an ECM or a VFD driven pump, um, it would be set up on differential pressure, just like in the uh, previous example of a central pump that speeds up and slows down based on the opening and closing of, of modulating or zone valves at each of the individual heat pumps. So this is a, a primary secondary system that uses a delta T primary pump to control the temperature across the, 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 the loop field, um, and also a secondary pump 
that controls the flow through the heat pumps based on differential pressure. Um, we also see a case, many cases where instead of having a, se a secondary pump that's a central pump, each individual heat pump can use a very small circulator to, to induce flow through the heat pump and overcome just a small amount of piping between the heat pump and the hydraulic separator. The other great thing about a primary secondary system is that um, in many cases throughout the year, you might have certain heat pumps that are, are rejecting heat um, and some heat pumps um, extracting heat at the same time. So some of the heat pumps are in heating, some of the heat pumps are in cooling, which can lead to a situation where um, the, the temperature differential around this side of the loop is, is balanced. So you're just load sharing within the building itself. And then in that case, the primary pump is effectively not running. So you save a tremendous amount of energy, pumping energy across the ground loop because the ground loop's not required to run if you have some balanced loads. Um, even if the load's slightly unbalanced, some units heating um, and maybe a few more that are in, in, in cooling mode, that pump will still slow down quite substantially and save you a lot of energy. Um, the last type of, of loop um, that we see quite often in, in the geo industry is a one pipe loop. Um, this simply uses a single pump that um, would be sized again for the entire ground loop plus any of the uh, single pipe plumbing inside or piping inside the building. And each individual heat pump would use a circulator to overcome the head loss through the heat pump and the piping to and from that central uh, one pipe loop. <clears throat> so um, these are all basic schematics. Obviously don't have enough time to show all the details uh, to, to actually install the system, but one thing that I'll point out that is not shown in these schematics is flushing and purging valves, which are obviously uh, extremely important and required on every job. Um, flushing and filtering is, is required to have really good water quality uh, and is extremely critical to protecting the investment in these really high-end ECM pumps, particularly if you're specifying wet rotor uh, ECMs, because there's a very small annular space between the rotor and the, and the can itself. So you want to make sure that those pumps are well protected by flushing and purging properly. With that, I'm going to turn it back over to Ed, and he's going to talk a little bit more about details of uh, flushing and purging. Thanks, Tom. I uh, appreciate that. There's some good comments about the pumping. Um, one of the things that we hadn't talked in, about in much detail at all is designing a ground heat exchanger with the ability to get the air out of the system. This is a photograph of a reducing header. This is the kind of thing that is pretty important and uh, you really have to design it properly. And you have to also uh, make sure that the system is actually installed the way you're anticipating, especially because you're designing a system that is gonna be buried underground, under parking lots, in some cases under buildings, it's gonna be difficult to get at. And you wanna try and avoid a system where you need a great big giant flush pump like this to flush the system if you're going to do it. You can, should be able to design, design a system that you can use maybe a three or five horsepower pump to flush it to, uh, you know, 100, 150 gallons a minute should be the, high, or the highest flow rate that I've often used to design a system. It's important to get the air out simply because air can block heat exchanger uh, circuits, can corrode metal components, pump impellers, control valves, cause cavitation and damage circulation pumps cause a lot of noise in the system. And uh, you need to design the system that you can, makes it easy to get the air out of the system. So velocity of two feet per second, actually I'll design a system in most cases with a bit of a safety factor in there, um, of maybe two and, a quarter gal uh, two and a quarter feet per second or thereabouts. The pipe size is gonna determine what kind of flow rate that you need to achieve that. So if we're looking at a system We'll look at some systems we're looking at one inch, one and a quarter inch, two inch, and in a couple of cases, three inch pipe on there. These are the flushing flow rates that you need 5.6 GPM on a one inch, 8.9, and that's if it's SDR 11 pipe, 19.8, and uh, 43 for three inch. So if we've got a system like this, um, what kind of flow rates are you going to need to get the air out of the system? Just for ease of calculation, bump this up to nine gallons a minute on the, on the one and a quarter inch. Uh, 20 GPM on the uh, two inch and 44 GPM on here. Supply and return runner pipe, header pipe, and the U tubes themselves. And then in this case, this is the section of, these are the sections of pipe that are going to de determine the flow rate that you need to flush the air out of the system. 
So basically, nine gallon, nine GPM you know, fresh air to here. That's like an inch, inch and a quarter pipe here. You've got about 18 GPM. You've got, you can do that. Uh, uh, if you're going up to two inch, you've got the 22 G, 22 G, or more than the 20 GPM here, and all the way up through the whole system. 108 gallons a minute, approximately, to flush the air from this system. If you have the same system, and what you've done is change this piece of pipe right here, all of a sudden you need 20 gallons a minute to flush the air out of that piece of two inch pipe. That means in order to get that 20 GPM, you need 10 gallons for each of these. And that bumps up the flow rate that you need for the whole system like this, so 12 boreholes to 120 gallons per minute up from the 108. If you move this piece of pipe right here, change this from two inch to three inch, then you need 44 GPM right here, which means that each of these have to be bumped up to 11 GPM. By the time you get to flush the whole system, you're looking at 132 GPM. So that's made the contractor's job a little bit more difficult. Um, so if the contractor installed the pipe where he ran the three inch pipe up here because he didn't have the two inch fittings or whatever, for whatever reason, all of a sudden you're going to need close to the 44 GPM right here, which means you have to bump each of these up to 15 GPM. All of a sudden you've made the contractor's job quite a bit harder to get 180 gallons a minute through a three inch pipe. That's gonna be a pretty high pressure drop, pretty big pump. We're starting to get in the fire truck territory. And then make it even worse, if you've got this piece of pipe, you really, the contractor really screwed up or you really screwed up in your design, you need 22 gallons a minute through each inch and a quarter YouTube. And that's gonna be pretty tough to do. Here you're getting into fire truck territory for sure. 264 gallons a minute to flush this 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 uh, ground heat exchanger module. If you change the YouTube size, that changes the flow rates that you need. Here we're looking at one, a one inch pipe, six gallons a minute, and looking at where, in this case, this is an op, an optimized header design, six GPM through here, twelve through the uh, inch and a quarter, eighteen through inch and a quarter. 24 through uh, two inch, all the way up through. This is about the lowest floor rate you can get up, roughly 72 gallons per minute. If you change uh, one thing right here, let's say the headers aren't built exactly the same way, 45 gallons a minute through here, that bumps the floor rate that you need through each of these to 7.5 GPM through a one inch pipe. Makes it more difficult. And if somebody installs a two-inch pipe up to here with a pair of one-inch pipes uh, U-tubes, then you're going to need to bump this up to 120 gallons a minute, and that's going to get a lot more difficult. So especially since this, uh, this uh, assembly is all buried, in some cases maybe under parking lots, in some cases under buildings, it's going to be difficult to repair. And uh, I have seen, I have designed systems where you, it's virtually impossible to get the air out um, and without digging up stuff and changing things. Uh, and that gets really expensive. It doesn't help anybody, it doesn't help the industry. Or if it's left, it's gonna affect the way the ground heat exchanger is gonna perform. So basically, really looking at the detailed design of the final energy model, you gotta look at the geology, look at the site, and all of those kinds of details when you're designing ground heat exchanger. Nobody is designing this energy source, this heat sink for you. It's not the utility. It's not the uh, fuel and power manufacturer. It's all on you to design the system properly and then make sure it's installed properly to do that. Okay, I appreciate your time. Thank you very much. Any questions? We've got time for questions as long as you want, as far as I'm concerned. Great, well, thanks guys. That was an excellent presentation. Lots of great information. I'll start reading the chat questions here shortly. Just a quick commercial real quick. Um, we do have the IGSPA annual conference in Nashville, December 14th through the 16th. So if you need more information on that, go to igspa.org. There's a registration page. The agenda is online now and all the presentations and so forth. So that's at igspa.org, Nashville, Tennessee, December 14th through, through the 16th. Let me take a look at our, uh, our chat screen here. 
looks like we have some questions. Uh, one question I believe was answered already in the, in the public chat, software used for analyzing fluid hydraulics for different arrangements. Um, I see Ed um, mentioned he's using the GLD software. Do you want to make any other comments on that, Ed? That's uh, the piping design module is, uh, is pretty accurate. Uh, we've compared it to what happens in real life. Um, I think there are some other calculators out there. Geoflow has a calculator on the, the website. Uh, I think um, Lance McDevin mentioned that there's a calculator on, uh, on their website. I haven't used them, so I'm not familiar with them, but uh, whatever you're using, it's really worth spending a bit of time running several iterations of a ground heat exchanger design to make sure that you are getting low pressure drops and reduce uh, parasitic energy consumption with the pump in there. I have actually have seen probably about three or four buildings in the last number of years that have overheated simply because the way the, the selection of the pump or the, uh, or the way the pump is operated. Okay, very good. Uh, nice to know. Um, there's a question here on balancing valves. Um, it says here, I've seen, I've seen um, uh, uh, the balancing valves that I've seen require a minimum flow to be able to measure flow rate and at this minimum flow, the pressure drop is two PSI. If applied at a higher flow rate, pressure drop in a wide open position will increase. Pressure drop you indicated seems to understate the impact of balancing valves. Do you have special valves? Also, if all balancing valves are in a wide open position, how much balancing are they doing? I think that question is uh, for Ed. Yeah, the um, I try really pretty hard to make sure that the system that we've designed has is is relatively balanced throughout. I try and avoid using balancing valves if I possibly can, simply because it just adds potential problems with maintenance and uh, particles and things getting stuck in the valves, that kind of thing. If you, if you can avoid it, uh, I'll try and avoid it. I have done some system designs where I've used two different size of run out pipes. You've got to do the calculations. Uh, you might have some pipes with uh, some modules close by that might use two inch pipe and the ones that are farther away with three inch pipe. And there is software out there that allows you to calculate these to make sure that the system is going to work the way you anticipate and it's worth looking at. And it reduces pressure drop on that if you're in, in, uh, avoiding pressure um, balancing valves as much as possible is, is my first goal. Sometimes you can't, and then you've got to deal with the valves that you have to have to deal with. Okay. Thank you, Ed. Uh, there's another uh, question here about um, basic loop, loop field bypass to lower the head. In, uh, in some respects, the, uh, the primary secondary piping system arrangement that uh, Tom had uh, shown on one of the diagrams uh, does that to some degree. You can actually have a different flow rate in the ground heat exchanger than you do in the building piping system. Heat pumps themselves, especially when they're getting close to the uh, um, edges of the operating parameters. If you're getting down to 30 degrees or if you're getting up to 90 degrees, you want to get the full three gallon, gallons per minute per ton. Uh, but, there, uh, but there are times when you can try and, uh, and in some cases you may not have any choice but to put a bypass in the, in the ground loop. And I have done that on some situations. Uh, try and avoid that if you can, but uh, uh, sometimes that might be the only option, depending on the configuration of the land area that you've got you put the ground, ground loops in and that kind of thing. Sometimes it's impossible to avoid that, but uh, I'll try and avoid that when I can, simply because it makes it easier for the contractor to install it and less chance for screw ups. Okay, very good. All right, we don't have any more questions on the chat. Tom, did you want to uh, offer any insight on any of these um, comments? Um. Yeah, I don't see any other questions that, uh, that that's jump out at me there. Okay, great. All right, well, I certainly appreciate uh, the time, uh, Ed and Tom, it's been a great presentation. I appreciate the questions and uh, stay tuned to igspa.org for more information. We'll continue to have these events. We will re be restarting our town halls in January and I would appreciate any topics that you want for the town halls. Those are the second Wednesday of the month. But in the meantime, we do have other events like these scheduled and uh, just let us know how we can help. Thanks, everybody. Have a great rest of the day. See you. Thanks.